Hello and welcome to another tutorial about scanning film. We're looking at how to get the very best quality results you can from a flatbed scanner. I'm using an Epson V700, but you can apply these principles to any scanner of a similar spec, which is capable of scanning different sizes of film. Today I want to talk specifically about a piece of software called ViewScan, which I'm using in place of the Epson scan software to give us a better degree of control over the scanner and lead to better end results. Now for the purposes of showing you the software, it doesn't matter whether we're using the standard film mounts which came with the scanner, uh, or a technique like fluid mounting which we looked into last week. But since I am following on from a tutorial about fluid mounting, I'd just like to talk briefly about that. Now if you've prepared a fluid mount scan to take to the scanner in this mount, there is one last thing that you need to consider. And that is, if you compare this to the standard mount which came with the scanner, you can see that just here is the area where light is going to pass through the film and the rest of the flatbed is actually masked off by this black frame. That's important to stop light from potentially bouncing around in there and causing problems. Obviously we don't have that mask when we use a big piece of glass like this and the way we get around that is to use an opaque piece of plastic with a hole cut in it which just serves as a mask. Now you can buy these pre-cut from betterscanning.com. This one is cut for three frames of 120 film. You can buy them for strips of six or five uh, 35 millimeter, uh, or you can just buy them as sheets of plastic which you can cut through yourself. This just drops onto the glass and I'll show you how this works as we set the scanner up. With that step covered, I'm just gonna do a quick time lapse of setting up the scan now, uh, so you can see that I'll time it and you can see how long it takes uh, without the commentary of last week, and then we'll get straight into using the ViewScan software. that take about five minutes that was nothing like a personal best but I think it was the pressure of timing it and filming it uh, whatever I'll get over it um, it takes sort of three to five minutes to set this thing up and then you're good to go so let's just get to view scan and uh, look at the software side of it with the mount loaded into the scanner and the film on the underside of the glass we're just going to drop the mask onto the top between the light source in the lid and the frame with everything ready in the scanner, we can now just dive straight into the software. And I've reset all of my settings to their defaults in ViewScan so that I can go through the tabs with you and go over the important things to change. Uh, so let's take a look at this. This is the first screen that you'll be greeted with as you open ViewScan. Might look very slightly different depending on which version you've got, but the settings are gonna be much the same. The first thing we wanna do is to get ourselves out of basic mode here and look at putting it into professional. And that opens up the number of options that we have whole range of new tabs and options. Now we don't have to look at every single one of these options. Uh, fortunately, we don't have to understand what every one of these things means, but I do wanna show you how to change the things that alter the way that your scanner operates in a way that leads to a better scan. So let's go through these options. Under our first tab, input here. Uh, under our source, uh, we wanna be looking at the scanner that we're using. So you should be able to see that if your drivers and your scanner is plugged in and ready to go, uh, we should be seeing the scanner here. If you can't, then you might need to look at whether or not you've installed the scanner properly, but all going well, you'll see the scanner just here. The mode underneath here, you might find that this is set to flatbed. If it is, that's for a document and you wanna change that to transparency, which is what we use for scanning film. Uh, media, we don't want that to be image. We wanna choose the type of film that we're scanning. And in this case, in this example, it's black and white film. Uh, bits per pixel under here, uh, it's, although it's a black and white film, we're gonna scan it as 48-bit RGB. Uh, that might seem a little bit um, unusual in that we do have a 16-bit grayscale option here, but by scanning as 48-bit RGB, we get 16 bits of information in the red, green, and blue channel, and we can use those channels uh, later on to give us a degree of extra control when we come into Photoshop and do some post-processing. We're gonna to convert to a grayscale at the end for a black and white image, but it's a good idea to scan in color. Okay, uh, under here, preview resolution. This isn't too important, 200 DPI. This is just for the preview that the scanner does to show you uh, the layout of what we've got in the frame there. So we'll set this to 200 DPI here. Scan resolution. Now, the purpose of this tutorial is really to show you how to get the very best possible quality scan 
that you can from this scanner, not really to go for speed, but to favor quality, which is gonna take a little more time. Um, having said that, we don't wanna go all the way up to the very top setting of 6,400 DPI here. And that is because in real world terms, the scanner, whilst it claims to be able to scan at that resolution, it can't really manage to resolve anything beyond about 2,400 DPI. Um, there's a lot written about this, and I'm gonna put a good link in the description as to why the scanner kind of maxes out at that, uh, at that resolution. Um, but through my own tests and through everything I've read, uh, this is what I understand to be true. So we're gonna go ahead and put 2,400 in here. Number of samples. This is probably gonna be set to one when you open this up. You wanna push this all the way up to 16. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna force the camera to do multiple exposures of the image as it passes over the media. It, in doing this, it averages those exposures into one at the end, which reduces the amount of noise in the image. Next is multi-exposure, and you wanna make sure that box is checked. And what that does is it forces the scanner to do two scans. The first is kind of an auto exposure where it takes a good reading and gives you a decent first pass. And the second is actually a long exposure where it exposes the shadows. Um, the camera in this scanner is capable of doing long exposures and that forces this to do that second pass and to really bring out detail that might otherwise be lost in the shadows and the dark areas of your image. Um, and that's really all you need to worry about in this input tab. Under here you can set some defaults over where your uh, final images will save out, but you don't need to worry about that too much because we're gonna get to that later. Next along is crop. Under here, if this is on auto, just set it to manual and don't worry about any of the other settings in here. This is all just fine as it is. Okay, and a filter. If any of these are checked, you wanna make sure that they're not. You wanna make sure they're unchecked. So we don't wanna kind of automatically apply any sharpening or grain reduction or um, dust scanning or anything like that. Um, really we want to do all of those things later and limit the amount of kind of automatic correction and processing the scanner does in that respect so next along is color we're going to come back to this tab the only thing i would change in here at the moment is to if this output color space here is set to srgb set it to adobe rgb which is going to give you the widest possible range of colors or tones in this case of a black and white scan um there we go output color space adobe rgb so there we go, just set that there. And we'll come back to this once we've done our preview. Output, okay, so this is where you decide what you want your final output to be. So at the moment it might default to JPEG or to a PDF file. Now I'm gonna uncheck JPEG and check TIFF. And whichever box you check here, you end up with a whole bunch of options that are relative to that choice. So for TIFF, um, we've got an option over where we wanna save our final file. I'm gonna save this to a folder called Tests that I've set up on my desktop. And under file reduction, we just leave that where it is. TIFF profile should be checked under here. 48-bit RGB and magnification. Uh, printed size will make sure it's set to scan size, but otherwise everything in there is okay. Good stuff. All right, now we are ready to do our preview. So I'm gonna go ahead, click preview, and I'll probably fast forward through this next bit because it takes a little bit of time to do the pass. Okay, with the preview pass done, you can see our three frames just here. Uh, you might find that this, uh, this marquee is kind of set somewhere else, um, but you basically wanna draw around the frame that you want to capture. And in this case, I'm gonna include a little bit of the black uh, film edge around the outside, because I kinda like that to frame it. Um, and we're gonna scan this picture of the car here. I wanna go back to the color tab at this stage and just change a couple of our settings in here. If it's set to neutral under color balance, we really don't want any color balance to be done on this because uh, it's, um, it's a black and white image. And we wanna make our curve low here and our curve high all the way down to as low as they can actually go. And this is doing the same thing as when we adjusted the clipping in our Epson scan software, which had decided for itself that it wanted to pull in the, uh, the black and the white clipping values. Again, we're gonna end up with a picture that's a little bit muddier than the auto settings would give us. Um, but in effect, what we're getting is a raw file, um, which is giving us a full range of tonal values to work with in post-processing, rather than potentially clipping out some of the shadows and highlights there. We're gonna push our brightness up to say, I think about 1.36 we'll do for this. Um, and we've got our kind of image preview just there. 
everything else is okay in here and that's okay to go now. So I think we can just go ahead and click on scan. It will take a little bit of time to scan this. We're asking a lot more of the scanner than we would be if we just kind of hit auto and go where it starts to favor the speed over quality or find some balance in the middle. Really we're looking at getting the very, very best results we can and it probably will take about um, five, six minutes for each of these passes. So we're looking at kind of, you know, 10, we want to allow 10 to 15 minutes for this scan to process, which uh, it sounds like a lot, but it's going to give us a huge file with an awful lot of detail. Uh, for 35 millimeter, it's obviously quicker, but I'm going to hit scan, fast forward through that scan, and we can then take a look at the result we've got at the end. So once that scan's complete, it will open in Windows Explorer or a preview window like this. And all I've done is gone ahead and opened this up in Photoshop uh, and just added a couple of simple curves adjustment layers um, to bring back some of the mid-tone contrast and overall contrast into the image. And just done a very, very simple, uh, very subtle sharpening pass to resolve these, uh, these fine details. Uh, those steps are very similar to what I showed in my previous video about Photoshop and Lightroom. If you haven't seen that one, I'll link to that in the description. So I'm going to zoom into this image so we can look at it at 100%, uh, which you can see just down here. Um, and that way we can see just how much detail has been resolved in the, uh, in the text and the grill of the car here in the, uh, in the badge. And if we go over to the, the headlight, we can see the word halogen and the detail in the headlamp here. You can see the very fine film grain of Kodak T-Max 100, uh, which is a film I love to use and scan. It's got a very even kind of sandy grain to it, which I really like, and it always captures lots and lots of detail. What I would say is if you're saving this to share online, I would reduce the image size to something sensible for whatever social media you're planning to share on. Uh, I'd go to File, Export, and Save for Web. So within here, you have the means to convert to sRGB, which is important if you want to, if we're working, especially if you're working with color, because we've uh, captured this as an Adobe RGB image, which is not a format that the web uses, so your colors will be slightly off if you don't take this step. Um, but yeah, um, it's a huge image, so it's, it's showing us the whole size thing here. I'm just going to click cancel on here. And the last thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, resolution and really what you can expect to get from this image if you print it, what level of detail you can expect to see. It can be a little bit of a difficult subject to get your head around sometimes, the idea of resolution, but I wanted to show you a website which gives you a very simple way to understand it. Uh, firstly, we need to know our image size. So I'm going to look at just what we've captured here. We've got 5490 by 5414. It's not quite square um, in the way I've cropped it here, but we'll call it 5450 square for the purposes of calculation. And I'm going to link to this in the description. It's from Tool Studio and it's a megapixel calculator amongst a bunch of other tools they have here. Um, but I'm going to type in 5450 uh, and 5450 is the square picture, calculate megapixels. And it tells us that we've got close to a 30 megapixel image, which is huge. Um, but what does that really mean in terms of what we can print? If we go down to file and print size here, it's currently telling us what kind of image size we can expect if we save it under different formats. But if we click on max print sizes for DPI on this part here, just scroll back up. This is actually now giving us an indication of what sizes we can print at. And the really important one here, if you're printing uh, to, say you were going to put it into an album or a photo book, for years the standard of quality for print publications has been 300 DPI. That's about as much detail as our eyes can resolve at the kind of distance that we hold a book at. So this is the figure that we're looking at here. Whoops, that one there. And that shows us that we can make a print of just over 18 inches at 300 DPI, which is great. It's, a, it's like a kind of small poster size. Um, if we wanted to go bigger than that, uh, we are going to see a little bit of a softening in the resolution if we are kind of looking very closely at it. But if you're going into these sizes where you're sort of talking about poster sizes, Generally speaking, you're not going to be standing so close to them and our eyes can only resolve a certain amount at a certain distance. So you can get away with dropping the resolution to 240 or maybe even 150 DPI here. Uh, and still, you know, it will still look a very good image. Really, I think that kind of wraps everything up for this lesson. Uh, I've covered uh, this kind of two-part thing on improving our hardware and software. In future videos, I do want to share some meaningful comparisons over scans between the, uh, the Epson standard kit and 
the improved gear that we've been using here. Uh, and I also want to cover lots of other things. So as always, I appreciate your comments and suggestions on future videos. We haven't looked at color yet. That's something I'm going to get into. Um, but yeah, for now, I'd just like to say thanks for watching and I hope this was useful to you.